right. And if you are just joining us, I want to welcome you. Uh, we've uh, just opened up the webinar here tonight. So if you're just joining us, we're going to take just another minute or so to allow everybody to load up and get logged into this presentation tonight. Uh, this is the presentation um, in conjunction with uh, Lincoln Middle School. And also, uh, if you're joining us from Emerson Middle School, we welcome you as well. We've opened it up to both middle schools here in District 64. Uh, but we are uh, you know, very pleased to have uh, Dr. Heber with us, who's going to be leading a three-part series. Uh, so uh, it'll be tonight and also the next two Tuesdays at 7 o'clock. Um, and these are presentations for parents, uh, but for all of us, really, uh, and just being able to really, uh, you know, cope with uh, some of the situations and the challenging times that we're now facing. Um, tonight's, you know, presentation is part one. Uh, it's a connection piece of a presentation about nothing's normal, uh, understanding and supporting the well-being and school success in these pretty unusual times. And so uh, hopefully that you, uh, when you attend tonight, you'll be able to walk away with some useful tips to be able to put into place and get some better understanding. Uh, we hope that this is a supportive group. Uh, we openly uh, you know, ask that you submit your questions to us and using the chat and the Q&A features here, we're able to see those. Uh, so we'll be able to respond to those in real time. Um, but again, I want to do some quick introductions on us uh, on the call with us tonight. Uh, Tim Gleason, who's our assistant principal over here at Lincoln Middle School. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Uh, Bill Connor, who is our school psychologist here at Lincoln and also uh, working across some of the other schools here in District 64. And our special well, guest well, tonight well. is Dr. Brenda Huber, uh, who is uh, working at the Rush University Medical Center as one of the professors and also as the executive director of the Rush Neurobehavioral Center. And uh, again, not only uh, with her professional uh, you know, expertise right now in those fields, but uh, she is a parent. She is a former middle school teacher. Um, she, she really has a lot of insight here. And so we hope that tonight's presentation is one that is uh, beneficial uh, for all of us here. Uh, again, this is something that uh, started out uh, in our planning uh, prior to the pandemic. So even before uh, we got to these unusual times, uh, we were starting to see the need for the social emotional well-being of our students. And we really were looking at different ways that we could support our students here. Uh, we were very fortunate through one of our grants here through the Elementary Learning Foundations grants that we were able to uh, really step up some of our uh, curriculum and our resources in helping our students and helping our staff respond to student needs. And so I wanna thank them for this opportunity. But uh, again, I just wanna welcome everybody and we hope that you uh, join us not only tonight, but also uh, for the other two parts of this series coming up over the next two weeks. So Dr. Huber, hopefully that was a good enough intro for you. I'm sure you've got one as well, but again, I'm gonna let you go ahead and take it over from here. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be with you all. I um, think it's ironic that we're talking about connection tonight um, via this medium. So um, right now I can see David and Dr. Connor and Tim um, on the screen and I can't see you at all. So um, I used to teach communications to middle schoolers and one of the things that I taught them is that um, if you're not having eye contact Contact with the teacher and giving the teacher nonverbal feedback, it has a huge impact on the teacher's performance. Teachers tend to ramble on and take a lot longer to share their message when they don't have eye contact. So we're going to do our very best tonight. And um, I'm thrilled that you made the time to be here to talk about and learn about um, together about um, parenting um, middle schoolers during these very abnormal times. So I'm, I'm gonna ask you um, and give you some suggestions for the most meaningful experience that we can have together given that we're trying to talk about connection um, in this medium. And the first is to just try to eliminate the distractions that you can and try not to multitask right now so that we have this one solid um, hour together to focus on this important topic. The second one is I'd love it if you'd have some paper and pencil or some other way that you might be able to um, to write, to take some notes and to do some activities together. And then the last is um, I wanna try something new, which is to um, invite you to type responses into the chat. So I'm gonna be talking to you just like I am now and asking you questions. And if you'd be so kind as to put your responses in the chat, 
we've got it designed so that um, nobody can see your names on that other end. Um, we can see the names and we can see what you, um, what you interject, uh, but that'd be so helpful because right now I feel like I'm just talking to the three people that I can see and I'd love to hear your thoughts as we go along. So the first thing that I'm gonna talk about is um, the, the definition of trauma. So um, trauma is a response um, that any of us have to a deeply distressing or disturbing event, um, an event that overwhelms our ability to cope and causes us to have a lot of different reactions. One is a feeling of helplessness, could diminish our sense of self and our ability to feel a full range of emotions and experiences. That's the definition of trauma. And it's really our reality right now. Um, we are all human beings who are experiencing chronic stress, um, a collective trauma. And in truth, there's just nothing in the research to even compare this experience that we're going to um, other than war. So um, the, the literature on how um, people respond to a chronic um, stress like a war is the closest um, proxim, pro, uh, facsimile to what we're talking about today. So together we are experiencing, there's, there's no one who in the, on the globe who's not experiencing some level of trauma right now. And so all of us are operating with some level of impairment. Um, so think about that. Um, because we're in this um, situation, um, none of us are at 100%. And um, so I just wanted to ask you to think um, about that this way with me and maybe estimate um, in, your, um, in your thoughts about yourself right now, um, if 100% is you on top of your game, where are you at um, right now in the middle of this pandemic? How would you estimate your level of um, functioning? right now in the middle of what we're going through. So if you could um, put some estimates of um, your, your level of functioning right now in the middle of this um, pandemic, I'd love to see those. So the first person said 75%, so 80%, something like 75 to 80%. So lots of um, people around that, around that level of operating. So you think about um, um, being below your peak, right? One of the things I thought about, oh, somebody says um, in the first few months, they were really down around 25%, but now up to about 75%. So um, they adjusted, right? They adjusted to um, living within these um, times to a great extent. I put this, um, these glasses of milk here because it's kind of how I'm imagining it. If you think about that glass on the right, that's like our normal level of stress right? Parenting middle schoolers, teaching middle schoolers. We've got a level of stress that's always there. But with the pandemic going on, it's like our glass is almost full of stress, right? So any, any little thing that falls in there can spill it over the top. And um, this, is our, this is our reality right now. Um, another way I've been thinking about this is, you know, I'm a parent. I'm also a professional. And um, I kind of reflect on what's my, what's my level of functioning as a parent? What's my level of functioning as a psychologist? I'm in my bedroom right now, right? So I'm um, constantly um, flipping back and forth between these roles that I play. And sometimes one or the other um, becomes, um, gets sacrificed, right? As I'm going along. So think about that yourselves. You know, parenting is, is super hard. It's a super hard thing. And um, partly it's so hard because we care about it so much. Like um, if you're like me, it's like the, the very most important um, uh, role that I play is, is parenting. So um, when I start to see um, my, my functioning as a parent suffering, um, it's really easy for me to, to get hard on myself. And so the next thing I wanna bring up is um, the idea of self-compassion. And I'm also going to ask you tonight, as we talk about these tools, um, I'm thinking, you know, I'm studying these tools as a professional and I'm thinking about how to apply them to my life with my kids. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing when you look at these different tools, 
where you see them um, potentially having a use in your home and in your life and um, how you might use them um, in, in your own personal life, but also in your life as a parent with your, with your kids. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing about that. So this is a resource, the Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook. Love it. Um, and the main premise to it is that um, we need to give ourselves permission to feel whatever it is we feel. Like these are unprecedented times. If you think about it, I mean, before we had the pandemic, the only exposure we had to pandemics for the most part were horror movies, right? And we're like living a horror movie right now. So whatever it is that you're feeling, it is perfectly appropriate to be feeling it. And um, so just giving ourselves permission to feel it, acknowledging that, hey, you know what? This is a moment of suffering, a period of suffering right now to be going through this. And so I'm going to be, um, talk to myself like a really good friend, right? Talk to myself like a really good friend. And um, one of the things is that often when we have a feeling, we make ourselves feel worse because we judge ourselves for feeling that way. So um, when I'm starting to feel like um, I'm not, I'm not parenting as well as I want, or, you know, my, my, my kids aren't doing well. And um, I, I have the thought I should feel differently than I do. It doesn't help me. It only makes me feel um, worse. So um, I want to encourage you um, as we go through this and we're reflecting on ourselves as parents um, today and, and throughout the next couple of weeks that you, um, whatever it is that you're feeling, that you provide yourself some compassion because this is, this is a tough time. All the time, we have these psychological needs um, for connection, for control, and for containment. And the word containment just basically means the ability to manage um, what's going on inside of us in a way that we can still feel um, a sense of basic safety inside and not get overwhelmed. I mean, that's not my favorite word, but you know, it's like three C's. So, um, so we have these three C's, uh, these three needs all the time. But when we're in a period of chronic stress or trauma, these are at the forefront. They're at the for forefront and they need to be met in order for us to um, do the other kinds of things that we need to do um, as we develop. So trauma is isolating. Um, it's the kind of thing where we feel alone, even when we're around other people, we might, even though we feel alone, we might also withdraw from our social supports and just keep our experiences to ourselves and so on. And we might notice that we're thinking things like, I'm alone, nobody understands me, I'm the only one like this, there's something bad about me, I don't belong, I'm just unworthy, I'm unworthy of connection. And I wonder, um, as you hear those words, first of all, they're kind of depressing, right? They're kind of depressing thoughts. But I'm wondering, have you heard that, um, those kinds of thoughts um, in your own mind, in your kid's mind, or in other people, um, out of the mouths of other people who are around you right now? Go ahead, if, you, if you've heard these kinds of thoughts um, coming out of, of the mouths of others that you care about, put that in, um, put that in our chat. So um, it's the kind of thing where, um, yeah, I should be able to handle this better, right? Having those thoughts um, are totally the kind that um, we have to extend self-compassion, right, to ourselves. So trauma, um, we might not even notice that we're starting to feel alone, right? Because we don't necessarily attribute it to what's going on, um, that we're surrounded by this. And um, here we are as either middle schoolers or parents of middle schoolers, and in the best of times, it's a really complex period of development, right? You know, I've been a middle school teacher, I've raised middle schoolers, I've had middle schoolers who are foster kids. Um, it's um, my favorite age. It's absolutely my favorite age, um, but it is, um, it is a complex period. And um, there are kids who, who experience middle school as an adverse um, event, as a traumatic period, right, for whatever reasons. Um, and it's, it's partly because there are some major tasks that are happening developmentally in middle school, um, becoming more autonomous, making more decisions for ourselves and so on. Imagine how that's complicated by a pandemic. 
feeling competent, having success in areas that matter to you, navigating peers and social relationships, feeling belonging, and then having developing your identity, understanding who you are. Those are all tasks that are happening for our middle schoolers. And it's in the middle of the pandemic, right? Where there are so many, um, so many barriers to being able to move forward. So this is a reason to feel compassion for ourselves right here, right? We are doing something super hard right now and we're coming together um, as, a, as a district, as a community to support each other in, in doing this. And um, so I'm, I'm so glad that we're having this three-part series and I hope that, um, that you all participate and get something out of it and contribute to each other. Um, so this next, this is where you need your first piece of paper, okay? So um, we're talking about connection tonight. I wanna start by us assessing our own um, connection, our own support network. So this little diagram is supposed to have you at the middle and then circles around you where you write the names of people that you trust or feel like you can rely on, you feel close to, okay? So um, a kind of lay out your support network on that um, piece of paper that you have there. We really need to have people who really get it, right? People who really understand us. And um, we need regular contact that we can anticipate with them. Regular contact that we can anticipate with others who get us. That's what connection is about. So these are people that we can talk about what we're going through um, very candidly. We can feel seen and heard and validated by these people who care about our experience. And we can feel a sense of belonging with them. Now, some of us might be putting some people on these rings that we, that we see regularly, we talk to regularly and so on. Um, but the key to connection is you actually feel better afterwards. Um, we've probably all had the experience where you talk to people and you can kind of commiserate together, but you don't really come away with that feeling of being heard and understood and, and a sense of belonging. So as you, as you fill out your, your chart there, I'm wondering how many, how many social supports are you finding that you consistently connect with? People that you, um, that you can rely on to um, talk about what's going on for you in your life and feeling that um, sense of being validated, being heard and understood. If you could go ahead and put that in the chat. The, um, this can be kind of a stark reality, right? If we realize that we've um, gotten so busy that we aren't regularly communicating with, with people who we have this kind of connection with. What are you finding as you, um, you do this activity? About five or six, um, that's great. Um, yeah, somebody said, I really thought I'd have more, right? I really thought I'd have more when I sat down to um, pull out this sheet of paper, but I'm realizing that um, I don't have the supports that, that I, I need to connect with. Now think about doing this same activity with or for your middle schooler, right? Thinking about this experience for your kids. It doesn't necessarily have to be you, right? But I'm um, beginning to think about who do they have on their rings that they are regularly able to connect with. And I'm reading here that the connection is difficult now without the in-person, that there's um, a sense of distance even when we're trying to use these electronic means. And um, it, somebody else commented, it's interesting to think about on this um, these rings where one's family falls versus one's friends. Yeah, yeah, people are, people are recognizing that um, there, there is a need, right? There is um, a lack of this kind of support that we're talking about. So let's talk a little bit more about how we can go about meeting this need for connection. Um, the first, these are the four things that we're going to talk about. So the first one is to speak and be heard um, and um, to have that feeling of being validated. Another one is to share our experiences creatively. 
So creativity is an outlet um, where we can, in, in a way, feel heard, even though it's not verbal, if that makes sense. The third one has to do with this consistent and predictable um, connection so that we know we can count on it, that it's, that it's coming, right? And then the last one is to be acknowledged as an important part of a group that you belong in this group and you're valued. So let's take the first one, speaking and being heard. Um, this is an opportunity to um, express um, emotions. So um, think about this in the context of um, your kids. Um, you can also think of it in context of your, your partner or your family that um, you want to be, um, be able to speak and be heard and they do as well. So. Um, you want to be able to express both your positive and your negative feelings and be acknowledged and feel like your thoughts and your feelings and your presence matters um, uh, to that person. So um, just to be clear, this is about being with another person. It's not um, about um, advice giving or problem solving. Um, we're, we're not talking about, you know, your kid comes to you and says, you know, I'm I, I flunked two tests um, today, and you jump in and start saying, "Okay, you know, well, what do you, you know? What can we do to bring this, turn this around?" You know, um, this is about um, empathy and connection. Okay, um, and I, I'm speaking to myself here because it's 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 pretty easy to jump to problem solving or advice giving um, when your child starts to talk to you about something that um, they've got a lot of emotion about. These are some listening tips, okay? Um, they're called the ORs skills. So the first one is an open-ended question. And you just can't go wrong with an open-ended question. What this means, a closed-ended question is something that answer, you, a kid can answer with one word or usually yes or no, right? Did you have a good day at school? That's a closed-ended question, right? It's just gonna, um, or, um, I practiced open-ended questions so, so much, I'm not even thinking about closed-ended questions right now. Um, open-ended questions are those that um, invite um, a fuller expression. So I gave an example of what was that like for you? So if my child comes to me and says, I, I flunked two um, tests today, um, I might say, wow, what is that? What was that like for you, right? And it's inviting and opening the door for more expression. Um, if you can think of some open-ended questions that work well in your family, I'd love it if you put some in the chat. We all know the, you know, how was your day? That is technically an open-ended question, but it doesn't work that great, right? Lots of times we act our, ask our kids, how was school today? And we get um, good or bad. We don't get um, that fuller expression. So if you could put some some open-ended questions in the chat, that would be great. Ooh, tell me something you learned today. Lovely. Um, what was the thing today that made you smile? What was the best part of your day? What did you learn today? So these are openers, right? These are things we could open a conversation. How did that make you feel is always a, a wonderful one. Tell me more about it. Technically not a question, but it opens the door to um, get fuller expression. Um, what was the best part or the worst part of your day? Those are awesome. Those are awesome. Um, so open-ended questions, um, you can't go wrong because they are eliciting more information, more sharing um, from, from your child. The next one is um, affirmations. And this is basically you're responding in some sort of way that communicates an appreciation or approval and one I love is just, it means a lot to me that you're telling me about this, right? Because my kid does not have to be telling me about this. Um, and especially um, with, with all the struggles that they're facing to be able to, to communicate um, what's going on inside of me. So affirmations are just ways of, of communicating commu appreciation or approval. The next one is reflections where you're trying to identify and reflect back to the person who's talking to you about um, what you think the emotions are that they're feeling, okay? So you sound really sad. You sound really disappointed about how you did on that, that test. Then um, summaries, 
show you heard the essence of the story. So you're kind of just saying, um, capturing back to them what it was that they said. So, oh, you didn't study for either of your tests and you didn't do well. <laughs> this just happened, by the way. That's why this um, theme theme here on this, um, this was, this happened this week. Um, so um, when you think about open-ended questions, um, which was, is kind of the, um, the, the gold, um, the gold, the golden bullet here under ORs. Um, think about um, the who, what, when, where, why kinds of things, right? Um, so you're really wanting to to draw out the whole story. Um, uh, someone said, you know, why do you think um, that person said that, or why do you think they did that, right? So getting some of the thoughts that are going on, like what's the story your child's telling themselves right now about what's going on socially. Um, and, and I'll even say, what's the story you're telling yourself about this right now, um, so that we can get some of those um, thoughts and feelings out um, into the open. So I want to encourage you um, to practice these um, or skills when it's not a big deal, you know, when or, or practice them with a partner or someone so that they, um, they come easily for you. Because um, one of the things I find is that when my child's coming to me with any sort of emotions, you know, when they when they're stirred up, they're feeling anxious, afraid, upset, angry, or whatever, it's hard to not try to um, move to problem solving and so on, but to really sit with them. And I'll tell you this example that just keeps coming up as I was going through here about my my um, teen who who flunked well believes that she flunked two tests um, this week was all I did was sit with her and, um, and provide um, affirmations like, you know, this is, this, is, um, this is really, really a tough situation to be in, right? I talked to her like a good friend in a way and I provided compassion. I asked open-ended questions and all of that. I never told her once, um, you know, what she should be do doing differently or whatever. And all of a sudden she got to a point after she felt heard and, and validated and understood and everything where she said, well, I guess da da da. And she just had a shift and decided what she needed to go and do, right? But it was because this need for connection was met um, uh, after having this really upsetting and disappointing experience. So great job on the open-ended questions. Thank you for sharing those. I'm probably going to use some of those with my own kids, so appreciate it. The, um, the next one is the one about creativity. So sharing our experiences with creativity is another way of just expressing ourselves, right? And so things like dance and movement, imaginative play, music, poetry, art, creative writing, journaling, these can be done individually or they can be done collectively. And I gave the example around art of doing something like a mosaic or a quilt or something where um, kids can be expressing themselves and it can be then kind of put together in a larger hole or something like that. So, um, you know, you think about like, I don't really like to do yoga by myself, but um, I used to go to the gym and do yoga with other people, right? Um, and it's like any kind of um, creativity that we can do collectively, there's something um, that meets another sort of need. When you're all moving in unison, there's a sense of belonging and so on. So think about these. Um, for, for my family, um, I have one child who, whenever he is free um, and, and not doing schoolwork, is writing music, doing composition, or writing choreography. And um, that's all for fun, but uh, it is his way that he's expressing um, this time in his life. Um, another um, thing that we do that I think is um, creativity also is these online family party games, you know, where um, you get a topic and you have to get up and speak on it or whatever, or you make up jokes and things like that. It's very light, it's, um, but it's, a, it's an experience where we're um, creatively expressing ourselves. Um, can you think of um, ways that you or your or your children are doing something creative to to express themselves that you can put into the chat? Some people are feeling themselves drawn to do this, to draw, drawn to do um, things um, creatively. Ooh, online cooking classes, baking together. Nice. What else? Things that you're finding yourself doing. I think a lot of people are doing food together right now. Ooh, painting. 
a lot of people are doing food together because it's a it's a bonding thing, right? Um, playing with clay and so on. Those are great. Um, just running, doing um, exercise. Awesome. Awesome. So um, it's that creative element, either alone or together, um, is, is somehow healing for us and can give us a sense of connection. Um, all right, let's talk about this next one, um, which is um, consistent, predictable communication. So this is why people have a therapist, right? And um, there's, I, I personally am a firm believer in therapy for everyone. Um, maybe that's why I'm a psychologist. Um, but ha knowing that you have a particular time that you're going to see somebody and you're really going to be able to share your heart and someone who cares about you is going to listen to you. So um, teachers do this, coaches do this. Um, it's harder when we're not in person because teachers will catch a kid when they're leaving the classroom or have a, um, you know, eye contact and exchange with them privately, even within the large group and make that connection. So these things are harder to do. Um, you know, we have um, teachers and coaches that make a point to connect with certain kids regularly. Um, and it's just harder. It's just harder to do in this environment that we're in. But um, so think about that. Um, and again, this goes back to our circles that we wrote earlier about a consistent um, connecting point. I have some groups of people that we do, um, you know, do Zooms with every so often and um, talk about real things, right? Um, so, uh, the next one, this can happen through a school club, an activity or a group. Um, my kids, um, I have one who literally plays a multiplayer video game with friends. We moved recently. So with old friends, multiplayer video games, and it started integrating new friends from, um, his new school. Um, I have, uh, a child that plays Dungeons and Dragons every Sunday afternoon for X amount of time. And um, I don't care whether the homework's done or not, you know, um, when it comes to these things, because these are um, important, consistent, predictable communication routines for them with their peers. And as we talked about earlier, in middle school, this is a really, really important time. And social things are often very hard during the middle school years. And, um, you know, this pandemic has thrown a lot of kinks in um, what we normally do to support middle schoolers in building these kinds of relationships. So um, those first two bullets are just thinking about um, these consistent, predictable communication routines that could be with, with anybody, any group that you're in. And, um, oh, I just thought of um, another one with, um, this is at home, though. I have um, right as the pandemic started, we bought a massage table. So I have a, a child um, on the spectrum that loves to have a back rub. And um, when I do the back rub, um, we're not even having eye contact, but we do the back rub and she relaxes and she starts to talk. She starts to talk about what she's thinking, what she's feeling. So that's a consistent thing that we do, not every day, but um, it's something that um, she can count on that's gonna happen. And she knows she has a point in time to share thoughts and feelings with me. Um, at meal times, we have a three question routine that we do at our meal times where each person, adults included, say um, what's going well for them, what they're thankful for right now, and what do they need? I think it's a great question. What do they need? And it's often um, what, um, it's not like a thing, you know, it's not like something tangible, but you know, like I need um, uh, more sleep tonight, right? Um, I, I like to be careful with that third question, the what do you need though, because I do know, like I'd use this in the workplace also, and sometimes people um, will um, turn it into what should I, what should I be doing? instead of like, what do I need? I need to get my work done or, or something like this. So it's not what you should be doing. It's what do you need? What, what's your, what's, um, what do you sense that, that you need right now? Um, a lot of people have um, these consistent predictable routines around bedtime, but uh, many of these um, get tossed to the wayside by the time your kids are middle schoolers, right? So maybe this is something you wanna resurrect some sort of way um, and I don't actually ask my kids this question, but it um, came up in the chat um, a couple times, the idea of what's one mistake you made today and, and what do you learn from it, kind of um, fostering the growth mindset. 
So something like that. And um, another thing that has come up a lot for me with teens I'm working with right now is teens used to get driven places a lot, right? You know, they had got driven to gymnastics, driven to, you know, um, ice skating or whatever. And they had these consistent times alone with their parent to talk where their parent wasn't working or something. And um, so as those things start to come up again, the kids are recognizing that they look forward to that time. Um, with their parent in the car and they're hoping that their parents not going to be talking on their cell phone while they're on their drive and um, these are things they never gave to any thoughts about before so um, can you think about um, natural points in time within your day or within your week where you have um, a, a predictable connecting point that you could um, nurture if you if you can think of that, um, put that in the in the chat. Somebody says, um, I often sit down and quote stupid lines from TV shows with my son, right? So it's like his turf, his desires, and I'm joining, I'm joining with him. That's awesome. Um, running errands, just um, or picking out dinner and going doing meal ideas, those are great. Um, another person had mentioned earlier that the cooking and the meal planning has really become a uh, connecting point um, for for their family. Can you think of any other times that, um, as I'd love to hear um, your thoughts, I find um, that um, I'm spending a lot of time, you know, in, in my bedroom at my desk, but um, whenever I hear them come to get food in the kitchen, I'll stop what I'm doing and go out there um, and, and catch them as they're eating and have the connecting point. Um, somebody said they're really finding it hard to find the time. And I, I think for us as professionals, um, our work life has really, um, uh, the boundaries around our work life has really um, expanded as we've, as we've come to work in our homes, right? And there's not a clear stopping point. Um, we like to read Ask Amy in the paper together. That's awesome. Um, just going and kissing them on the forehead and telling them that you love them. You can do it quick. I love that. It actually brings tears to my eyes because I love to do that with my kids. Um, and um, it doesn't matter what they're doing. They still beam when, um, when I come and just give them a little kiss on the forehead. <laughs> do it quick before they run, somebody said. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. So um, a consistent, um, predictable, um, connecting point. And, and I liked what somebody had said, you know, because you can think about um, your kids' routines um, and merge yourself into it, which is what I'm doing when I hear them out there and I, and I come out and join them while they're, while they're eating. And um, somebody said, whenever they want to talk, stop what I'm doing. It's a hard rule, but when I do it, I never regret it. That's beautiful. All right, so think about those times that we can, we can catch um, and our kids can start to expect it. They can know that it's gonna come. All right, next one. I think this one's a little harder um, to acknowledge group membership. I told you I have um, one child that's really into technology and she's written these apps. Um, you know, she wrote a, a, an app um, for, um, Zooms, you know, so that you can um, write, um, get, it's a talk cue, a talk cue. And um, she's written this app for her peers so that when they um, are at home, they still have on their app, they have their school bells and they have, um, you know, tells them where they're supposed to be and keep them on track and everything. And she shares these with her coding um, club nobody ever, nobody ever writes back, nobody ever comments on them and all those kinds of things. So this is her way of being creative, um, but she's not being acknowledged for her contribution in this group, right? She's not feeling like um, the contribution that she's making is, is important, right? And um, so we've got the creativity piece um, and that's how she's expressing herself, but she's not getting that reinforcement in, in, her, in her club. So think about th a lot of things that have been happening during the pandemic are like neighborhood signs, people putting things on their windows to support the healthcare workers and things like that. It's a way of belonging. Um, it's a way of belonging with others. And um, things like having t-shirts or having the sign in your yard that you go to school at District 64 or 
or whatever, and, and other ways that people can join together to contribute in some way, like when people were making masks together and, and different things like that, those um, ways of being able to see that you're doing something that matters to the group, you're being acknowledged. The ideas um, that um, I came up with around family was again, the meal planning that has come up several times family decision-making meetings. So when the family needs to decide something that um, everybody has a voice and it's actually discussed um, together. Now that we're all living in close proximity to each other pretty much 24 seven, um, the decisions I make, the decisions that somebody else makes affects everyone, right? Um, just popped in my head. I told you I have um, one child um, on the spectrum does not like the smell of cooking vegetables. So when I'm going to cook cauliflower or I'm going to cook asparagus, I say, hey, I'm going to be cooking the vegetables. Um, you might want to get whatever you need out of the kitchen, right? So these are things that we never talked about before. But family decision-making meetings where people feel like they're, um, they're, um, they are valued, their, their um, thoughts and opinions matter. And then the last one, I put a, um, a link to a family emotional safety plan. This is like if you would sit down with your family and come up with like a fire drill plan or whatever, a family emotional safety plan is like, how is everybody in the family going to deal with their strong emotions? So that when we're living this close proximity, um, my family knows when I get edgy or I get upset or I get irritable, here's how, here's what I'm going to communicate to you. Here's how I'm going to take care of myself or something. And the kids know the same. It's a family emotional safety plan. Um, and, um, you know, I'm mean, basically that communicates to your child that um, they, they matter, right? If you're going to um, talk to them about how you manage your emotions um, in the context of the family. So that's the four. And, um, Again, when the need for connections met, we can focus on other things, those developmental tasks of being a middle schooler and our developmental tasks of parenting um, a middle schooler. So um, there are gonna be times when we wanna communicate some structure and some clear expectations. And many of you have seen um, an I statement before. The beautiful thing about an I statement is it can help us maintain our relationships while we're making some kind of a request, okay? So an I statement goes like this. I feel blank when you blank because blank. It would mean a lot if you'd blank, right? And so this is something that clearly you can model doing with your, with your spouse or others um, who, who live in proximity to you. Um, and your children can learn to make these um, requests as well. And it maintains the relationship while expressing um, uh, your request. So I put some examples of times that I might be inclined to use an I statement. And I'm wondering if um, you can think of times as we're living. So, so my child might say, I feel really grouchy when you cook um, smelly vegetables because um, I really don't like the smell. It would mean a lot to me if you would let me know beforehand that you're gonna do it so I can get my macaroni and cheese and get out of there, right? Um, what are some situations that you might use an I statement? Can you think of occasions with your family that you might wanna use an I statement? Um, I'll give you another one for me. Um, I feel um, annoyed when you stay up super late because um, the dog barks when you go to bed. It would mean a lot if you could go to bed um, before 10. Right? That would, that's an I statement. So um, I statements around chores um, I'm seeing, um, cleaning up after themselves. I definitely have somebody who um, leaves a lot of things behind um, everywhere he goes. I feel sad when you put no effort into school. That's good. I feel sad when you put no effort into school because I know you're gonna be sadder tomorrow, right? Or um, I see you get, um, get sad as well. I mean, a lot to me if you would, um, if you would work on it. Perfect. Those are very, very good. Um, 
let's see, because I know you're so capable. Yeah. Um, this, this next slide, I'm looking at our time and I'm wanting to end right on time for us. So some general do's and don'ts are, um, we don't want to express shame and rejection and ridicule or this um, communicate you should do, feel, or be different than you are. I personally find this very, very difficult. It feels like it's the definition of parenting that I was raised with is that the parent is constantly telling the child, you should do, feel, or be different than you are. Whatever it is that you're doing, you should be working on your homework, you should be you know, getting your teeth brushed, whatever. And so we're trying to move away from the communicating that you should be different than you are instead expressing that kiss on the forehead, the delight, the appreciation, the affection, and communicating that your very existence is more than enough um, to be worthy of love and belonging. That's the message that we want to communicate and meet that need for connection. So I want to leave you with um, a loving kindness meditation. And I'll tell you, um, loving kindness meditations can be done a number of different ways. But generally speaking, you're, um, when you're meditating, you're um, uh, sending loving kindness to yourself and you're sending loving kindness to another person and you're holding that person in your mind. I personally love to do a loving kindness meditation when I'm upset with someone because I'm surrounding them with light and with love. And um, if I, then I go and do my um, I statements and I talk, I'm in a completely different frame. I personally love to do a loving kindness meditation when I know I'm going to be um, part away from my child. My child's going to go to hybrid or um, I'm going to, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm worried about what, you know, whatever it is that they're going to tackle. Um, I can um, meet my own need for connection and I can, um, in, my, in my heart, um, share that um, connection and love with, with my child. So um, I'm going to do this um, little meditation with you. If you want to, you can close your eyes. Um, if you um, don't, of course, don't. So um, the way we're going to do it is um, I'm just going to guide you to breathe. So I'm going to close my eyes and I'm, as you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. One of the keys, if you want to relax when you're doing breathing, is to breathe out longer than you breathe in. So breathe in and then breathe out. And now um, in your mind, just say these words with me. May I be safe. May I feel loved. May I feel heard. May I feel valued. May I feel accepted. May I feel a deep sense of belonging. And may I know that my very existence is more than enough to be worthy of love and belonging. And now I'd like to invite you to hold an image of your child in your mind's eye while I read this aloud. May our children be safe. May they feel heard. May they feel loved. May they feel so valued. May they feel accepted. May they feel a deep sense of belonging. And may they know that their very existence is more than enough to be worthy of love and belonging. Deep breath in. And deep breath out. And with that, I'll say that um, I am sending you loving and kindness um, in this week as you um, do this very hard job that's so very important to us of connecting um, with, your, with your middle school student. Um, this week, and I hope that um, you come back next week and we can talk about this um, need for control that is so um, intensely activated by experiencing um, this collective trauma together.
Thank you, Dr. Huber. I appreciate you being here with us tonight. Um, I know, you know, our, our theme was connection tonight and hopefully um, I, I feel a sense of connecting with all these parents that are, are chiming in on the chat. Um, not only are we a community here at the school and within our own family circles as well, but it's uh, great to feel that connection with uh, all the other parents as well. So uh, again, hopefully this is something moving forward that we can continue to build on. Uh, again, I wanna thank you for, for taking us through this tonight. Um, again, if you're from Emerson or Lincoln or you know, just have any other middle school students in your life, uh, we know it's a challenge, you're not alone. Uh, and again, uh, we are systems of support here at the school and uh, hopefully you'll find those supports with each other as well. So uh, looking forward to the next couple of weeks, uh, but again, Thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, I can't think of a better way to end the night. I, I, I feel good after that, Dr. Huber. So thank, thank you for walking us through that. Um, but again, thank you parents for joining us tonight. Uh, this is gonna be recorded. So we will hopefully have this uh, up and posted for you soon. So uh, if you have other friends or family members that did not get the opportunity to join us tonight, please feel free to share. Cause again, uh, this is such a great resource for all of us. So with that, have a great night.